Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, this is, I think, the sixth time I've been to Finland, uh, but every other time has been in Hel Helsinki, so it's very nice to get out of Helsinki somewhere different, and uh, I I've enjoyed myself here so far. Um, it is a great honor to be invited to this uh, conference. A little bit intimidating standing here on my own looking at all these faces. Um, I'm sorry I don't speak Finnish. I hope, uh, I hope that most of you can understand most of what I say. Um, it is an honor because Finland is held in such high regard in Europe for certainly for mediation and, and restorative justice, but for many other things uh, that you do so well. And I must say, whenever I see reports about Finland, it's always positive. And I'm always very proud to say, oh yes, I've been to Finland. And I have some very good friends in Finland. So I, I, uh, I bask in your glory as well. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the approach that we have adopted in Northern Ireland and focus on uh, what we call the, the narrative dialogue approach. So I need to tell you a little bit about the, the background in Northern Ireland. Um, our law was changed fairly dramatically in 2002. And basically what the legislators decided was that restorative justice should be at the core of how we deal with young people in conflict with the law. Uh, and what this means that every single young pe person who admits to a criminal offence will be offered a restorative process, will be offered the opportunity to meet the person that they've harmed. It is not the judge that decides, it's not the prosecutor that decides, it's not the social worker that decides. The young person is always offered and the young person will decide whether that goes ahead and then we talk to the victim and they will decide whether they want to meet the young person. Um, and most, most young people agree to do it, around 90%. Um, so in a small country we've had I think about 25,000 of what we call youth conferences, restorative youth conferences. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, it's, it's a development out of victim offender mediation because it includes, it actively encourages young people to bring their family, uh, maybe other supporters, a teacher or a youth worker, and also for the victims uh, to bring, to bring um, supporters. We can also invite professionals who are involved maybe with the young person, a social worker or a psychologist. Uh, there must be a police officer present. The young person who's caused the harm has the right to bring a lawyer. And we also like to invite representatives of the community. So a conference might have anything between at a minimum six or seven people, but at a maximum 15 to 20 people. To, to look into the harm and what should, need, what should be done about it. As I say, we've had around 25,000 conferences. We're a small country, even smaller in population than Finland, 1.8 million. So I estimate about one person in every 20 in our population has participated in a conference. And uh, the research says that um, uh, there's about a 90% uh, satisfaction rate, rate. People are very happy. It was controversial at the beginning, there was a lot of resistance, but now the judges see the value of it, the prosecutors, the police, and the victims um, as well. It has reduced reoffending um, when compared to what we used to do uh, with young people who offended. A uh, high level of participation by victims and a high level of satisfaction. And one of the interesting things for me, which wasn't anticipated, is the number of people our country, the number of young people that our country locks up in detention has reduced dramatically. We're nearly at sort of finished levels of, of custody. Um, uh, right now, there's usually about five, six or seven young people who um, have been sentenced to, to detention. And these are for very serious crimes, maybe murder or serious rape. 
Um, so it's been, it's been considered very, very positive. It's not without its faults, and I, I'll touch on that uh, briefly uh, uh, in a moment. The, myself, as a, as a member of the University of Ulster, uh, was asked with my colleagues to develop the model for uh, restorative justice in Northern Ireland because it was brand new and also to train all the practitioners. Um, and so we had to think, it has to be a model that applies to all types of young people, from those who have committed very low level offending to those who have committed very high level. The only people who are excluded from the uh, restorative justice in Northern Ireland are young people who have committed murder or serious terrorist offences. Everybody else, right up to, we've had attempted murder, some very serious violent offences. Um, so it had to be very, very adaptable. But of course it also had to be very flexible for the huge range of victims uh, that, that young people uh, might have. Um, so we didn't want a highly structured, uh, prescriptive approach. Um, the popular approach in Britain is, is known as the scripted approach, where there's a script of set questions. We did not think that would be flexible enough. Um, so what I want to describe is, is, is the approach we took to how we, uh, how we engaged with young people and their victims. Um, firstly, just to, to start, uh, put, to put it in a little context, um, in 1999, the Council of Europe um, published a recommendation on uh, mediation and penal matters. And it was a great step forward. In fact, the introduction of that led to the founding of the European Forum for Restorative Justice, because for the first time, there was now a general standard for mediation throughout Europe. Um, and it has is, it is served Europe very well. But in 2018, the, um, the Council of Europe asked a consultant associated with the European Forum for Restorative Justice and the European Forum to advise them on a new recommendation that would take the place of the one on mediation. And it is a recommendation on restorative justice. So this signals a change. And there are just a few things I want to highlight uh, in the difference of the def definition of what um, the practice is. So it is now restorative justice rather than medi mediation. It speaks of the harm caused by crime rather than just crime. So that means it's a, it's a more personal focus um, on how individuals are affected by crime. It speaks of the facilitator rather than the mediator. So this opens up uh, the idea that there is more to restorative justice than victim offender mediation. And it talks about other people who are affected by harm. So it opens up the fact that, and, I, and I'll give you an example of this in a, in a short while, that when a crime occurs, it's not just the direct victim that is harmed or hurt by it. It is other, other people, maybe the victim's family, the neighbors, aspects of society are harmed. So this opens up uh, the idea that more people, uh, more people's voices can be heard through restorative justice than simply uh, the, the direct victim of a crime. So this opens up the scope of restorative justice. It means that restorative justice can work in different contexts, not just criminal justice, and also there can be different processes. So this is another model which uh, has not been translated into Finnish. Uh, I, I don't have time to go through it in detail, but it shows that if we see that there are now three parties um, affected by crime, the, the person responsible for the harm, the person who's been harmed, and society. And in addition to that, those who are close to the person who has been harmed, and those who are close to the person responsible for the harm. So the circle has been widening um, of, of those people who can participate in restorative justice. As we widen the circle, then 
different processes emerge, not just one process. So we do have, like you can see, the uh, victim-offender mediation or dialogue there between the person who's been harmed and the person who's responsible. But in the middle, it, you can have all parties together in either restorative conferences or restorative circles, which have proved very, very valuable in different contexts. Or you can have restorative processes between the person responsible for the harm and society when there is no direct victim, that you can have circles or conferences or mediations between representatives of, of the local community and the, the person who's uh, caused harm to that community. Similarly, victims, I mean, one of the problems with restorative justice is you always have to catch the perpetrator. There will always be a victim because they report the crime, but if we don't catch the perpetrator, that can't, they have no restorative opportunity. So we need to think about that. How can we restore victims if we don't have the perpetrator? Um, so there's possibilities that society can meet with victims in circles to help them restore their lives after being harmed by a crime. So I'm suggesting to you that this recommendation from the Council of Europe opens up many more possibilities. You know, for instance, I'm very well aware that there is a thriving um, mediation approach within the schools of Finland uh, that I think is, co is contributing to the high quality of educational experience that young people receive um, in, f in the Finnish schools. But there's a range of other opportunities within neighborhoods, within organizations, within prisons, um, a huge variety of contexts in which we can apply what we know works when people have harmed each other. What I, what I want to suggest now is that restorative justice, because it can be applied to so many different contexts and there are so many different processes that can call themselves restorative, that um, we can no longer say that restorative justice can be defined by a method like mediation. And, and the way the European Forum is moving is that we need to define it by the values that restorative justice stands for. And these are, are the ones that we've come up to. I think values are very difficult to define. It's an ongoing process of refinement and change. And the European Forum is, is about to appoint a committee on values to review our values. But this is the sort of starting point. So for me, a crime represents an assault on the dignity of a human being, the victim. But as you will know, having met the perpetrators of crime, that often the reason they are committing crimes is because they have not received respect in the past. They have had a hard life. They have not, um, they have not been treated well in the past, and so they move towards uh, uh, mistreating other people. So that's the first value. It says that it is, it is about the, respecting human dignity. But it wouldn't be true to say that restorative justice is only interest, interested in individuals. Increasingly restorative justice is interested in the quality of society. And this, I think, is very important at the moment in almost every country in Europe who are struggling with change, with migration, with refugees, with intercultural issues, that restorative justice stands for solidarity uh, for everyone beyond difference, diversity. Um, and, and restored justice is increasingly getting involved in intercultural conflicts. Um, and, and it stands for solidarity because if you believe that you're in a society that is connected, is interdependent, then that means you have a responsibility for each other. You cannot turn away from people um, just because they are different or because they've harmed somebody, that we have a responsibility to fulfill. And this is one of the key values that I think support the restorative process. But solidarity must be based on justice. Um, I think restorative justice strives to help victims undo the injustice that has been caused to them when somebody commits a crime against them. 
but also to try and make society a more just place by giving ordinary people an experience in participating in a justice process where maybe the person who has harmed them makes themselves accountable to the victim, not to the court, not to the state, not to the law, but to the actual living flesh and blood person that they've hurt. They have to account for what they did to that person. And the process then is based on dialogue, communication, and that dialogue can only work if people are willing to tell their truth. There are many truths, as we'll see when we look at the narrative approach. But the people come with a, a, an honesty to the process. And also, if they make promises, if they promise, if they agree to certain action coming out of the restorative process, that those promises are sincere. They're not just making promises uh, because they want to get away. They want to get away lightly. So those are the, the, the key values that, at the moment, the European Forum thinks are important, that really matter um, uh, to restorative practice. It's not enough, I believe, to build a practice just on values. We must be able to tell the public that there is good evidence for what we do. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, um, but basically what these next slides are saying, there has been a lot of research into the effectiveness of restorative justice. And the research is overwhelmingly positive. We can say that victims experience a better sense of justice if they participate in a restorative process. They feel less fear, less anger, less anxiety. Um, and they, they're more likely to receive an apology and they're more likely to forgive the person that's hurt them. And you as practitioners will have seen that. It's difficult for the public to understand that that happens. But as you know, it does happen on a regular basis if you have an honest dialogue. So it, it gives the victim a real experience of justice. I think it's also the research would say that the offender, the perpetrator of the harm, also experiences a very personal sense of justice. Um, they're not made to feel like they are a bad person. They may be a person that has done a bad thing, but they're not stigmatized and labeled through restorative justice in a way that quite often the formal system does do. Um, they, interestingly, they often report that they feel more positive towards the police because they've been treated fairly. Um, they, they get a chance to express their remorse and they're much more likely, if they do make a promise to repair the damage, they're much more likely to keep that promise if they've had a direct contact with the victim than if they've been ordered to do so by the court. The immediate outcome, I think, of restorative justice is that the perpetrator is accountable for the obligations that arise from the harm. There is a satisfactory plan to address the harm, agreed by all parties, and the plan is completed in full. And for me, this is a different and a more valuable experience of justice for ordinary people than what the court delivers. And the research backs that out. And I suppose the question that everybody asks, there is no substantial evidence that, um, sorry, that, um, restorative processes reduce further harm, that reduce the, the rate of reoffending amongst the perpetrators who participate in restorative justice. On the other hand, there is evidence in Europe and in my country too, that there is a danger within restorative justice if it gets too close to the criminal justice system and too dependent on the criminal justice system, that it takes on the values and aims of the criminal justice system, which are largely around public protection and reducing reoffending. There's nothing wrong with those aims, but what the research says, if it gets that close, victims tend to be forgotten. More and more countries um, are not engaging well enough with the victims uh, of crime. 
they're still marginalized, even in those countries that have good restorative justice programs. And this is something that none of us can be satisfied with. For this reason, the European Forum for Restorative Justice is working on values, but also on evidence, and translating those into principles of practice and standards of practice. So the new committee will be working on trying to develop general standards of practice that uh, people should be following if they're involved in restorative justice to show that this is a, this is a, a serious approach um, to, uh, to justice and can be taken seriously by the state and by the public. Um, and I think when it's done well, the people who participate in restorative justice get the experience of justice as it should be in a real way. And that is a very valuable thing, I think, in modern society. This is the model that we have developed in Northern Ireland. We call it the, the oops, the balance model. And what I want to do from now on is illustrate our approach by using um, a story based on a real case. So it starts with the harm, and the story is that um, two elderly people are lying in bed asleep at night, and um, the woman wakes up, she, she hears a noise downstairs in the house, she wakes her husband and she says, do you hear that noise? And he says, yes, yes, there's somebody downstairs. I'm going down to investigate. She says, don't go down, it could be dangerous. He says, of course I'm going down. So he goes down the stairs, walks into the living room, and he sees this young man looking for something valuable in the, the room. He's pulling drawers out, he's throwing things on the floor, uh, knocking things over, and uh, the man shouts, what the hell are you doing in here? And the young man looks around, startled, panics, and in order to get past the, the elderly man, he runs up to him and pushes him out of the way so he can get through the door and escape. He pushes the elderly man, and the elder man, elderly man falls heavily on the floor, hits his head on the hard floor, and passes out. In the meantime, his wife can hear all this, and suddenly it goes quiet. The young man has escaped through the door, and is, is away. So she comes down very, very frightened and comes in and sees her husband lying in a pool of blood. She doesn't know if he's alive. And then she notices he is breathing. She calls the ambulance. She calls the police. And he's taken to hospital um, where they patch up his head, but also keep him in hospital for three or four days to give him tests in case there's any impact on his heart or any other conditions because he's, he's quite elderly. Um, the police tell the, tell the woman they think they know who did this or they've got a fair idea. They say there's a gang of young men who gather in the park across the road from your house. They take drugs and they would guess that it's one of them has come in to steal money to get drugs. So they quickly investigate and they find this 16 year old who um, is arrested and admits to the offense. And this is the case then that is referred to the, um, the agency responsible for uh, restorative justice. It causes a lot of concern in the street. Neighbors are very sympathetic towards the elderly people, but also angry that it happened and fearful that maybe it's going to happen to them next. So this brings in not only the person who did it, the direct victims, but also society, the neighbors. It's in the local papers, you know, druggy attacks elderly man in his own home. It looks really bad. 
So our process then is, well, for one of our key principles is that the problem is the problem, the person is not the problem. So what you will hear, the neighbors, the media will be saying, it's terrible, these drug druggies in this park, they're terrible people for doing this. Um, our job is to try and focus on the harm that's been done and the suffering that it's caused. We have a distinction in our approach that harm is material. So we already know that uh, somebody has broken into a house, probably damaged a window to get in. Um, they have broken some valuable property in their search for uh, something to steal. They have seriously hurt an elderly man who had to go to hospital for four days and had to get so many stitches in his head. Um, but nothing was actually stolen because the, the young man panicked. So we can measure that harm. It's material. But the suffering is a different matter. The suffering that the elderly, the elderly couple have been through is something that we will not understand until we talk to them. Um, this probably doesn't work as well in Finnish, but in uh, English, um, I speak of harmful behavior creates a rupture, a break. Uh, the first thing is it interrupts people's lives, both the victim and the offender. So in this story, these pensioners' lives have been interrupted by this terrible event. They, they cannot get on with their normal routines. But also the young man. The young man has been arrested. He's awaiting to see what's happened. So his life has been interrupted by it. Um, often they feel disrupted out of their routines. Um, they feel powerful uh, emotions erupt, as we'll see when we go and meet the pensioners. And also, what, what the, the research would say that crime can corrupt moral reasoning. It's obvious with the, the perpetrator who has to justify what he does. He creates a rationalization for what he does, which um, you know, is, is amoral. But it's also interesting for the victim. Um, uh, the research would talk about shattered assumptions in the victim, that their assumptions about how society is, how human beings are, become shattered by this. So it, it has a, a, a very um, fragmenting um, effect on you know, your general philosophy of life. And lastly, I've talked about bankrupting resources. By, um, by punishing offenders, often they're uh, restricted in the resources they need to la lead a good life, and, and that pushes them more into crime. There are different approaches to take to this. Um, this model suggests that um, we tend to hold people accountable, make them responsible for what they've done, but we may also support them, particularly uh, when they are juveniles. So this gives four different approaches that we can adopt to any case. One is to feel angry and want to punish and coerce the person. Another can be afraid and want to withdraw and just manage the situation. Another might be to feel sympathy, sympathy for the victim or sympathy for the perpetrator and, and protect them and rescue them from the situation. And the fourth option is what I believe is the restorative one, one that is based on respect for all people. And it restores by including all the parties, preparing them and facilitating their participation in the process, and then helping them to transform the situation so that they can get back to the lives that they want to lead. The process, the way we, we describe it, is um, we have a preparation phase, then there's the meeting, and then there's the action that comes out of the meeting. And the skills are related to the skills of including people, including all the people who should be there, preparing them and facilitating their participation, and then helping them to change the situation through action, through the action that they've agreed to take. 
So this finally brings me to the method, the narrative dialogue approach. And I'm going to explain it using this story of the two pensioners who were, who were robbed in their home. Just a, a, a couple of quotations. If you want to understand, I think, narratives, the best thing to do is, is to look at the storytellers. So I have some quotations from people who write books, write stories. First one is Salman Rushdie. Those who do not have power over the story that dominates their lives, the power to retell it, to rethink it, deconstruct it, joke about it, and change it as time change, truly are powerless because they cannot think new thoughts. So one of the things I want to try and explain to you is that restorative justice can help all the parties have power over their own stories and to transform their stories. Here's another one from Maya Angelou, uh, a great uh, African-American female writer. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. So not, it's, it's remarkable. You would think in this story that the pensioners would be telling their story to everybody, but actually in real life, neighbors will call and be sympathetic, but they don't want to sit for an hour and a half with a victim and listen to the whole story. They'll reassure, they'll say, is there anything I can do? Uh, yes, it's been, very, it's been an awful experience, but no, I, I've got to go and make the, make, make the dinner tonight, so um, I'll see you tomorrow. It's remarkable that how people don't get the chance, and that is the same for perpetrators. I was, doing, I was training some prisoners in a high security prison in Northern Ireland and restored a practice. And when we came to this, this was the thing they latched on. Nobody ever listens to our story. Our parents don't, our friends don't. Even our lawyers say, no, I don't want to listen to it. Just you answer questions that I ask you. Because if you tell your whole story, it'll go badly. So they never get a chance. They carry these stories of harm around without being able to express them. And this is restorative processes allow them to tell their story. This is a writer that I like particularly. She's a, a female Nigerian writer, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. And she has a great TED talk. If, you want, if you're interested in this idea of stories, Google uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, The Danger of the Single Story. Uh, it has really inspired us to think more deeply about stories. And one of the things she says is, all stories contain truth. The problem is their truth is incomplete. Now, when I heard that, that helped me understand the restorative process. Um, so I want to illustrate it then with this, this um, story. One of, one of the things, I don't know if this works in Finnish, but complete has two meanings in English. The complete can mean getting the whole story, the complete story. But it also means to finish something. To complete the story is to finish the story. So those are the two things that I think a good restorative process does. It helps people to see the whole story from different perspectives. And in doing that, they have to adjust their own story. And then they can feel, we have completed that story. I can now get on with my own life. I don't, I'm no longer trapped. Sometimes I think it's like a good novel, in a way. Those of you who, who like to read um, good novels, it's, it's great to get lost in the story. You enter a new world that's different from your own, and you want to know what's going to happen. Are they going to live happily ever after? Is the boy going to get the girl? Is Who did the murder? And you read it because you're carried along by the story, story and the characters. And then you get to the end of the book and you close it and the questions have been answered. And in a way, you can never go back to that book in the same way. Certainly, I reread my favorite books, but it's never the same as the first time because I do know what's going to happen and I'm reading it in a different way. And it, it's a bit like that, that 
we enable people to complete their story, to find out what is going to happen, so they can let it, they can close the book and, and put it down. It doesn't mean they forget the terrible events. It just means they're not stuck in the middle of them. They've come out through the other side and can get on with their, their lives. So as I say, I want to illustrate that with, um, with this story. So we have different truths. We have a model of different truths. So there is the forensic truth, the facts. And um, we, we, we believe that it's very important to respect what happened when you're talking to both a perpetrator and a victim, to respect the detail of what happened. And we teach certain skills. And if anybody is coming to my workshop um, after this, uh, I'll go into more detail and we'll, we'll look at the practice, but I, I don't have time to do that. But these skills are taken from motivational interviewing, um, and, and we find them very useful skills to help people tell what happened. Um, so, we go and meet the, the two elderly people. We sit down in their home and we say, well, what happened? And the man being the man talks first. And he says, he, he recounts what happened as I've told you. Um, he tells it in a very angry way. It's clear that he's outraged that it has happened. Um, and the, the practitioner will not reassure, not be over, overly empathetic, but will just ask questions. We call it one of the skills going from the general to the specific. So, it was a terrible experience. Well, tell me what was terrible about it. Well, this young person in my, in my house, uh, he, he pushed me over and, and, and I, I passed out. My wife thought I was dead. And then I was taken by the ambulance to the hospital. And we'll go through that in great detail. How long did you have to wait before you got attention in the hospital? Um, how many stitches did you get? Um, and how, how many days did you have to stay? And what were the, te what were the tests? And what were the doctors like? And um, you know, what did it feel like to be in the hospital that long and your wife was alone at home? Um, so a lot of detail to respect what had happened. And similarly, the same process with the woman. Her experience, which is different because she didn't go to the hospital, she had to go back to the house. And, and stay there on our own. But the detail is so important, uh, we believe. Uh, and so we train our students to, to really be interested, be really curious in a respectful way um, about what happened. Because most people aren't. Most people just don't want to hear the full story. So that's the first stage. Then we, call, we talk about the narrative truth. And this is the more interesting because if the first one is trying to measure and understand the harm that has taken place, this now is looking at the suffering that took place. So we may ask, how has this all affected you? And, and there's a different set of skills that again, I won't have time to explain in detail, but I'll try and illustrate. So again, for the, the man, his narrative is, I have worked hard all my life. I have saved my money. I have done everything right. I have not broken the law. And we saved our money so that when we retired, we could come to this home. This is our dream house. This is the house that we have worked all our lives for, to live whatever days are left with us in peace. And this wee bastard has ruined that. He's broken into our home and disturbed our peace. And I just don't understand what gives him the right to do that. And he's very, very angry about this. 
And he says, you're coming to talk to me about restorative justice, about meeting him, listening to his story, being sympathetic, you know, oh, he's taking drugs, he must be a poor fella. I'm not interested in that. As far as I'm concerned, I am old-fashioned. This person has done something terrible. He needs to be severely punished. He needs to learn a hard lesson from this. He has caused us a lot of pain. He needs to feel the pain. So that's his story. And what about you? Turning to his wife. Well, you can see how angry my husband is. He has been angry every day since this happened. He goes on and on and on about it. I've told him he was foolish to go and confront the young man. He's an old man. He's, he's too old to, to protect me from, from people like this. He shouldn't have gone down in the first place. For me, I can't sleep at night. I lie in bed awake thinking it's going to happen again. My husband's right, this is our dream home. I love this home, I love this street, but I've told my husband I can't live here anymore. I've told him to sell the house. We ca I cannot sleep here, I don't feel safe. Uh, we have got to move to somewhere safer. Um, this has is, this is ruined it for me. So this is their stories, and you can see that although they've experienced the same event, they have different narratives, both of which are true and both of which are, de are deserving of respect, both of which causes the restorative practitioner a problem because the man is determined to have punishment and the woman's solution is to move away. Neither of those are restorative outcomes. So how do we... How do we deal with that? Well, firstly, we have to respect and understand um, the, um, the values that need to be restored. And we look at the, mo the emotional content of the story. And I have a very simplistic uh, formula for this based on our experience, and um, this is how we teach our students. So, if the harm arises fear, the person is saying, I value my safety, I need safety. So that is the story of the woman. If she engages in a restorative process and at the end of it does not feel safe, she has not experienced justice. If the harm causes anger, then simply I would say that this man is looking for justice. He has been a victim, as he sees it, of an injustice, and he wishes to have that injustice undone. Uh, and that needs to be respected. Sometimes harm is connected with a general sense of anxiety that isn't quite fear, but it's a sense that you cannot get your life back together again. You can't get back into the routines. It's not that you necessarily fear something, you're just, you just cannot be yourself again. Um, that wasn't necessarily relevant to this story. But this one was, and I don't know if any of you noticed when the mother, when the woman said, my husband's too old now. Now this is a traditional family, and this is a very traditional man who believes that it's his gender role to protect his house and his, his, his partner. And now his partner is saying, you're too old to do that. You can't do it anymore. So the practitioner picks up there is an element of shame here. And again, simplistically, we think if this man does not recover, restore his self-respect from this um, process, he will think that it was ineffective and he will not have um, experienced uh, justice. We have a problem because at the moment this man is saying, I'm not going to meet this young man. He needs to be punished. And we have an approach which is about 
not just listening to what he's saying, but what he's not saying, and exploring that. So the practitioner says, I want to go back to, you know, you're feeling very angry and you're saying this person needs to be punished. And if I understand you right, and tell me if I'm wrong, you think he needs to be punished because he needs to learn a hard lesson. I'm interested in what the lesson is that he needs to learn. But it's obvious. He needs to understand what is right and what is wrong. He has committed something that is very wrong. And young people today don't seem to worry about that. So he needs to understand what is wrong. And when you say, what is wrong, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, he breaks into the home of people who've done everything right in society, have worked all their lives, have obeyed the laws, keep themselves to themselves, and he has, you know, he has abused our rights to a safe home. He needs to understand that that is wrong, and he should never, ever do it, whatever circumstances he's in. He, and he also needs to understand the suffering he's caused. Look at my wife. Does he understand the impact that he's had on my wife? She can't sleep. She wants to leave this home. You know, he has ruined our life. All we wanted to do was live out our years in peace. And he has come in and totally ruined that. How do you think he could best understand that? And of course, I'm sure most of you see where I'm going with this. There is nobody else in the world that can teach this young person that lesson other than the victim, the two victims. Psychologists, uh, judges, police officers, probation officers do not have the capacity to teach that lesson to that young person. And of course, then the discussion comes on. And the point I'm making is if you understand what matters to people, you can then help them to see how a dialogue with the very person that they hate could be positive to them. Um, and so eventually, um, the, um, the person, uh, the, the, the two people uh, agree to meet the young person. Um, we advise not to go in and explain the benefits of mediation or restorative conferencing right away and spend a lot of time talking about how, how uh, positive an experience they might have. We do not advise people to sell it. What we advise is listen first. Understand what really matters and that will be different to every victim. We'll have a different thing that they matter. Once you understand what matters to them, then consider, is what I'm offering going to address that, uh, that need, that value for them? If you can do that, then in our experience, most victims then agree to go ahead. So the next stage is what we call the dialogical truth. Because remember, we have two truths so far we've heard. The man's truth, which is overtly an angry, I've been a victim of injustice narrative. And the woman's truth, which is, I feel very vulnerable and afraid now. And then there's another more subtle truth, which is the man feeling, I am no longer the man I used to be. Um, and I'm feeling some element of shame over that. But we haven't heard the truth of the young man uh, who did it. So I want to just fast forward to the conference. Now at this conference, the young man came with his father and his aunt, his father's sister. Um, the, um, the local priest, it was a Catholic area in, in Ireland, and the local priest came because there were so many neighbors were upset in the parish about it. And the next door neighbor of the victims. And the two victims plus their son uh, was at the conference. And there was a police officer and then the facilitator. So that was the conference, about eight or nine people. 
And it starts with introductions, ground rules, etc., why we're all here. And then we ask the young person to speak first. And so I'd like you to account for what you did to Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And his story is, I don't like school, so I leave school early and I go down to the park near to where you live. And there's a group of older men there who seem really cool to me. And they're always having a party in the park with alcohol and drugs. So I'm trying to get to be friends with them because uh, it looks good. And this night they said, we've no more money for alcohol. It's a house over there. Just two old people live there. It's easy to get into. Old people always leave money around or valuable things. Go in there, steal some stuff, bring it back, and then we can get some more alcohol for the party. And so I did it. It's the first thing I did. I did it to try and become friends with this gang. I feel stupid. I know it was wrong. But that's why I did it. I just wanted to look big to these older boys. And then we ask the victims to respond. And each of them tell the story as I've told you. It. The man looks the guy in the eye and says, I want to tell you exactly what you did. And he tells his story very forcefully. And the young man's head goes down in shame. So there is a sense that the man is, is reasserting himself, is being re-empowered by being able to explain to the young person what he's done wrong. And the young person is showing that he's ashamed of himself. Then the woman is asked to speak and she tells her story. This evokes a different reaction from the young person. The young person is like this when the man but as the woman talks, he, he looks up with real concern. And there's something about the woman talking that seems to have some sort of impact on him. And at the end of her story, he says to her, I'm so sorry. I never thought that that would happen. I'm very sorry. I want to tell you the real story now. And he says, about a year ago, my mother died. Now, when she was alive, I used to come back from school and she would be there and she would make me tea and she would make me toast and sit with me for a while and talk to me what happened during the day. And then I would go on and watch television or do my homework. Since she died, I just come home to an empty house, a cold, lonely empty house and I can't cope with that so I don't come home after school I go to the park and then I get involved with these boys uh, and what I told you earlier on is true but that's why I'm doing it and the elderly woman looks at her and says looks at him and says that's terrible and then looks at the father and says okay he's lost his mother but he still has a father what are you doing about it? And he says, my story is the same. When my wife died, I find it very difficult to come home. So I work just like you have done. I work hard. But on the way home, I might stop in the bar for a beer. And sometimes one beer leads to another. And sometimes I don't get home till quite late. And I don't know what my son's doing. I'm just, you know, so sad myself that I don't really think we aren't coping very well. And, she, and the, the elderly woman says, well, you should be. You are, I know you've gone through a loss, but you're still a father. You still have obligations towards your son. You should be a better father. And he says, I know. And then they talk about what should be, what should happen. 
And um, his aunt, the father's sister, says to the young man, look, I'm not your mother, but here's what I can do. I can greet you after school. I can be at your house. I can make you toast. I can make you a cup of tea. It's no substitute for your mother, but I can be there. After a while, I'll have to go home because I have to look after my own family. And the father says, I will come straight home from work from now on. And the priest says, do you not think you two should be getting some counseling for grief? You're not coping with it. You need to, to talk to somebody about this. And they both agree that they should do that. The neighbor says, you know, everybody is very angry about what you did. They think you're a very bad person. I think you need to do something for the community that will show that you're not a bad person. And the priest said, I remember you used to be a good footballer. Do you think you could come and help me train the young, the young kids in the junior football? Um, it's, you know, it's every Wednesday evening. And for that matter, you could come back and play for our football team and train with the seniors. I'd like you to do some work for the church um, as, as, uh, to show the, the community that you really are sorry for what you did. So slowly, an agreement came together. And people's truths were respected. And people came into that room feeling angry, afraid, because of something terrible had happened. But they left that room having sorted it out. There's a great film that has been made in Ireland about a rape. A very, if you can just imagine the worst possible rape, this would be it. It was cruel, sadistic, nasty. But the woman who was the victim was determined to meet the rapist. And the reason she said she wanted to do it, and she was a very strong woman, was she wanted to have a different memory of what happened. So before she met the rapist, all she could think of was the degrading, cruel, nasty violence that she had suffered to her body and to her spirit. After she confronted the rapist, she had a memory of an empowered, strong, courageous woman who could then let it go. And she said she left the meeting elated. She'd never felt so happy because this burden had been lifted from her. And I think this is what restorative justice does. It changes the story. I quote Miles Davis. Quite often when I do this, people haven't heard of Miles Davis because nobody, nobody listens to jazz. I hope some of you are aware of Miles Davis. For me, he was a genius. He did a lot of bad things. He was a heroin addict. He abused women. But when it came to playing a trumpet, I think he was a genius. And the story goes that Herbie Hancock, another jazz, jazz genius on the piano, was playing with Miles. And one night in an important concert in New York, Herbie Hancock hit the wrong note. And he thought, shit. Because Miles was a perfectionist and a very aggressive, angry man. So as soon as the concert was over, he went to Miles and says, look, I'm sorry. I know I hit the wrong note. It'll never happen again. I'm really sorry. And this is what Miles Davis said. When you hit a wrong note, it's the next note that you play that determines if it's good or bad. And I think this is what restorative justice offers both perpetrators and victims. Both parties have gone through a very bad experience and have got caught up in a narrative of harm. What we do is offer them the opportunity to play the next note, which for the perpetrator can be remorse, can be making promises to repair the harm, 
to avoid harming further people. For the victim, it can be, I faced the person who harmed me. I said what I wanted to say. I asked the questions I wanted to ask. I, my memory of that is not being a passive victim, but being an active person in my life. Now I can get on with my life. We create a different memory of the harm through our work. I'll just pass, finish with this quotation. People, even more than things, have to be restored, renewed, revived, reclaimed, and redeemed. Never throw out anyone. If I had more time, I would get, get you to guess who said that. Audrey Hepburn. She was a real European. I think she was born in Belgium. When the Germans invaded Belgium, she went to the Netherlands to escape from them. And then the Germans invaded the Netherlands, so she went to Britain, lived in Britain, and then became an actress and then a famous Hollywood film star. She ended her life in Switzerland working for UNICEF for children's rights. And it was in that context that she said that. Kitos. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, also, in this uh, presentation, we heard very many things that we can relate to. And I was looking at the questions that we received through our online system. And one of them was that, what, uh, what can you teach us? How can we uh, promote restorative justice also here in Finland? Because you seem to have a very advanced system in a way that it's built in the law. And it's the first step that you offer to each young offender. So you must have faced some resistance when you built the system. So how did you overcome that? And what kind of challenges have you faced? Yeah. There was a lot of resistance. Now the big thing was that the law was the law. But nevertheless, a lot of judges tried to bypass the law. They didn't like, a lot of judges did not like the fact that their discretion and power was being taken from them. No judge likes that. Um, so there was a lot of, that was the first resistance was from judges, but the best way to convince judges is through really good practice. So judges were receiving reports for the first time about what the victim thought should happen. And they began to think, well, before we've never thought about the victim, we've never heard the victim's voice. And I think that's one of the reasons that they now send very few people into prison. Uh, because victims, if they've had a satisfactory process, do not want punishment. This is the truth that I'm sure you experience. Very few of them at the end of a good dialogue want the other person to be punished. And so, Judges are hearing that in the reports they receive from the conferences. Um, so I would say now we're 80% total support from judges and prosecutors. Uh, the police were resistant, but we trained the police. Um, and now they're very enthusiastic. Uh, so good training is another thing. Good practice, good training. But the main thing is to show people the results, to convince them through the evidence. I think there's nothing better than that. The other thing that we did, and I don't know if it's possible in Finland, is that we opened up the conferences. So if a judge says, oh, I don't agree with it, we'd say, come to a conference, or a, or a journalist, or a politician. We've had some of the highest politicians in the land have sat in on a conference, and when they walk out, they say, okay, now I get it. Because you can explain it, but until you experience it, you don't really get it. Does that make sense? You know, it is an experience. It's not an intellectual or, you know, um, theory. It has to be experienced. So I would sort of encourage politicians, judges, members of the public um, to sit in on, on conferences. And I don't know if that's possible with your setup, but we made that decision. This is an open system of justice. Um, uh, if I had more time, I could tell you some funny stories about politicians who came to conferences and their reaction. Um, so catch me 
later on, and I'll, I'll tell you for the, if you're at the event tonight. After a couple of beers, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you all the all the secrets. So, uh, and and just just be open, be open and confident, and keep telling people that this works. It is a really positive experience of justice that people get. Yes, I agree that it should matter the most what, what victims and participants think. Yeah. That, uh, but I face the challenge that we are being demanded more and more evidence, even if we provide evidence. Yeah. And ours, in our system, mediation sessions are confidential, so I yeah. don't see how they could be open to public. But yeah. uh, So uh, are you meaning that your um, mediation uh, sessions are open to public? Or is it uh, Only, on the consent yeah, of the parties? The, anybody who comes to what we call a conference uh, must, must agree that it'll be kept confidential and can only attend if all the parties agree that they can be present. So there are certain provisos, yeah. Even if it is a, an important minister from the government, they still, the, the people have to agree to it. Oh, thank you. I'm afraid we have to rush uh, to workshops. So thanks okay. once more. Thank you very much.